and some edits based on her feedback to us, and then recast the other role to be someone who was a local actor in California who was also born blind, and so we rewrote the role to be specific to him. So that was kind of our first, our first two ventures, working with um, artists with disabilities at the core of the creation and, and inviting them to be on the creative team and tell us what to do. In 2015, the same year that we went to La Jolla Playhouse, we also did a large-scale immersive called Saints Tour. And it was, for us, I think, um, st stuck out as a, as a catalyst for us in learning and failure and um, being intentional about this work. Saints Tour was a part bus, part walking tour that took place in Braddock, Pennsylvania, which is about 45 minutes away. And I was caught in this uh, between two worlds where I was told from an artistic perspective that we could not book a charter bus for this show. Of course, because the optics of a big, a big expensive, beautiful charter bus going through a blighted neighborhood it is not what we were going for. And so I needed to book a school bus. And at the time, for varying reasons, I could not find a school bus that was ADA accessible. And so uh, we had found ourselves in a situation where we had created a show that was exclusive to a group of people that came to our shows all the time and found our space downtown to be perfectly acceptable and created something that by its nature was exclusive. And it's the first time that we started asking the question, who are we excluding when we do our shows? And so we just owned up to it and we told everyone that unfortunately, if you are in a wheelchair, you will not be able to come to this show. Please call us with any questions or thoughts or feedback. And we set out to be more intentional in the future, which was all that we could do. So chalk that one up to a lesson, um, one that felt really bad. <laughs> And so fast forward to 2016, and we were asked by uh, the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust to create a show for kids with autism spectrum disorder as part of the Pittsburgh Children's Theater Festival. And so we had a unique, we were in a unique position here because we are not a presenting company, we are a producing company, and we create our own work. So we were doing a lot of, I started at LEAD, um, a lot of learning about sort of best practices around creating sensory friendly shows. And they all assume, because they need to, that the show, the way that it's been built, is exclusive. And so we need to add on these things to make it accommodating, like a safe room, or like a visual or social guide to prep people on the way, give them fidgets, raise the house lights. And we thought, well, what if, since we're in control and we can make it ourselves, we try to see what it's like to employ the concept of universal design in theater making, and make a piece that at its core, the way that it's built, is already inclusive. So I don't need to make a change when someone with autism comes to the show. It's for them. And because it's designed with them in mind, and there isn't anything that we could anticipate that a neurotypical kid could not do that was built for these kids, maybe it would be welcoming to everybody. And so, uh, since we knew nothing about any of that, <laughs> and we didn't have the resources we need, we learned from our previous mistakes, and we brought people on board to tell us what to do. Uh, and so that was Arts for Autism, that was Firefly and Rebecca Covert, who also uh, presented Lead this week. And uh, we hired an actor who also had autism, who identified as a self-advocate and was not afraid to tell us what to do or how she felt, and that's uh, Vanya, who was sitting beside me. And she became part of the creative team. And so we set out over the course of six months, we would have a workshop week where we trained and, and uh, learned about autism spectrum disorders and the different ways that it manifests and how to reach kids through the arts. Uh, and then we'd go away and we'd write a little bit. And then we'd get together and we'd workshop some more and then we'd go away and we'd write a little bit. And the end result was an enchanted forest that came to life for about two hours every day uh, that kids could come to in time shifts. And I would do my very best to see whether or not they were able to wait or not able to wait. And I would get them into the forest as soon as humanly possible. And they would explore it at their own leisure and leave when they wanted to. Uh, and it was built intentionally so that it was rewarding uh, when you said yes to each barrier. So it ranged from starting from the highest light level to going down to the lowest light level so that every time you accepted the challenge of moving into the next room, it was actually calmer. Uh, and our designers made it in such a way that you could kind of control 
your level of engagement, meaning that the forest was alive and there were certain sounds in certain places. But an example is that we had a log that was in the middle of the forest and there was a site specific area where sound was emanating from the log. And so if you liked it, you could get closer to it, you could crawl within it. And if you didn't like it, there were many places in the forest that you could go. And so the goal was not necessarily to be all things to all people, but to have people who come in the door and they could find a pocket of the forest that made them feel comfortable and made them feel welcome with the overarching goal of having kids who are neurotypical and kids with autism spectrum disorders playing together in the forest. Awesome, very cool. And Vanya, can you speak a little bit about your experience um, and involvement uh, in some ways uh, consulting and as well as performing uh, in this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> gosh, well, part of, uh, I suppose part of an important piece of this to know would be that this was actually my first time being in a professional production at all. So that was a really interesting experience um, to be part of the development um, as well, my first time ever uh, being in a professional production. Um, I wasn't really sure what to expect when I came in uh, because complete, this was all completely new to me. Um, I had been in other, I had been a part of inclusion films before, which is actually where uh, Bricolage found, uh, how Bricolage found me um, was uh, they had seen some of my work with the inclusion film summer camps. Um, but I had never really been in an actual professional production with other neurotypical people. Um, and so it was a really sort of odd coming in because I wasn't sure where the boundaries were. I wasn't sure like where, how far I could go in saying like, no, that will never work <laughs> or um, here's what would work instead. But as we got further into the writing and the production, I became a lot more comfortable because, uh, and I think that uh, Jackie and uh, the director, Tammy, Tammy Dixon, became a lot more comfortable in approaching me as well and asking me, uh, does this aspect work? Um, are you made uncomfortable by this? And it's also, it's important to remember that I am autistic, yes, but I do not represent the entire autistic community. <laughs> um, and so that was a bit of a challenge for me because I am just one small part of this huge, diverse community. And I'm not even a particularly average part of the community, I suppose. I'm not necessarily uh, a person who uh, displays the typical traits of autism. And so I had to be very cognizant of uh, for th thinking, for example, well, this doesn't bother me, but what would, say, my three-year-old brother, who is a lot more severely autistic than I am, would think about this? Or this does bother me, but is that just my thing, or would it be a common problem? So there, it was a real balancing act going on. But I think that in the end, I feel that it turned, I feel that in the end, I was very comfortable coming forward with, with, um, with my thoughts and feelings. And I think that I probably, if anything, I would want to have uh, spoken up more <laughs> in the beginning. But overall, I think that I, don't regret uh, any of the things that I put forward. I think that overall, I I did a. Um, but but kind of like you know, we were sort of talking about this earlier too that it, it it's finding that balance of of when you, you know you're self advocating and really moving forward and then also being welcomed by the artistic staff and sort of uh, those questions being kind of sought out to you, right? So you're, so in this experience, it was a little bit like, I'm just sort of filling this out, but as you got more comfortable because those questions were asked and you, you felt that this artistic staff was being supportive, that you could get a little more comfortable in voicing your opinion and 
And, yes. and I think that's an important thing overall, right? Is just yes. the, having a welcoming environment yes. to do and that I in. Yes, I think that also part of it was that um, I wasn't sure where the lines, where the boundary of me as a performer ended and the boundary mm -hmm. of me as uh, helping to develop the show right. began. Right, right. Because I, I, as a performer, I have a responsibility to perform what's given to me, mm -hmm. but also as a developer, I have a responsibility to help create that. Mm -hmm. So that, that is also a really, diff, a really tricky sort of balancing act to, to have. And also a balancing act in, I would just think, the immersive theater, right? Because it's not as traditional uh, in its own creation, so that is an added... Thing that that happens with 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 just in the nature and context of of what you guys are creating. Yeah, right. absolutely. And I should I should specify that uh, in addition to being an immersive theater piece, our process was devised. Uh, so we created together. Um, we didn't have any concept really. We just had a goal for the show, and then we gathered a team of people that we hoped would creatively con contribute to that. Um, and then we would do different rehearsals and different exercises, and then little seeds of that over time created uh, the foundation for it. And it's interesting, you know, in immersive theater and in the devised process, it is a constant balancing act of where, do, where does my role as a performer and a contributor um, end and begin? And we find that as we get closer to opening, you know, the, the ranks of authority becomes more clear. You know, there's, there's a lot of space to contribute whenever it's just the seeds. And as we get closer, we have to start making some decisions and we're open to input, but there's only so many things that we can do that late in the game. So it's certainly a balancing act for everybody. Cool. And Vanya, just in, in terms of the broad experience, you sort of touched on this, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more um, about how, the, how actually the performance was for you like once once I guess maybe you guys opened and it there was no longer the the sort of need to feel like I'm collaborating or or did you were you able to let go of that idea that you're constantly sort of having to collaborate and then relax into I'm just now a performer in the show and I'm gonna just have this performance experience um definitely there was some of that definitely yeah. once everything was more finalized it became a lot easier to uh, just relax and uh, into the role of, well, now my role is to help guide these audience members and to connect with these audience members, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm doing. But at the same time, with immersive, with, with immersive theater, and especially with this piece, um, it's constant. You're still, even when, once you've opened, you're still constantly learning and changing things. Even after our opening day, we were still changing things the next day, and we still had to make adjust, adjustments mm -hmm. to the show. Um, just because, because the audience is such a huge part of this, and also because this particular audience has a lot of very unpredictable, both good moments and bad moments, um, there's just a const it's a constant conversation between the performers and the audience, and there's constant adjustments that have to be made, even while it's running. Right. Um, and Jackie, can you maybe speak a little bit more in terms of the theater's experience with this show and then also certainly in other work and other um, uh, work that you've done that has been inclusive, uh, what the audience engagement has been, um, especially maybe with this community, um, when you're seeing audience that maybe has not seen uh, a representation of themselves or that, that culture. Can you talk a little bit more just in terms of what your experience has been with that? Yeah, we. The feedback that we get from our audience with our immersive pieces as opposed to um, our, other, our other programs is overwhelming. Um, we find that we get long emails from people, sometimes a month after they've been to the show, talking about in detail what their experience was like in the space. Um, and so, and that presents its own challenge because if, uh, you know, your funders want you know, quantitative information and you've got tons of stories from people but no format to submit them, that becomes a challenge as well. Um, so we, we've become accustomed to a, a different kind of feedback. The thing that I think surprised us the most about the feedback that we got for this show um, was that we didn't have this audience before. Um, we had not done any sensory friendly programming, we had not done any outreach, this was our very first venture. And 
part of that was just relying on um, the trust and the festival to bring an audience with it because it was offering a whole showcase of shows that um, parents could choose from, which is great because throughout the festival, there wasn't just one day that was your day. There were several days that you could do lots of things. Um, and it was okay if you couldn't get out the door today, but you can get out the door tomorrow. So we were surprised to find that we um, filled 320 out of 324 possible slots when we had basically no audience to speak of um, outside of our partnerships and the people that, that brought other people to our door. Um, it was also very surprising once, you know, kind of once we turned on the forest, the forest was just on and functioning and active with these different neighborhood um, inhabitants and that was the way that we allowed kids who could only have a 15 minute experience and that was plenty for them up to kids who wanted to be there for 90 minutes um, was a, allow them to leave at their leisure and that was actually the role that um, Vanya ended up, ended up playing she was kind of the queen of the forest and you were told to go find her whenever you were ready to leave and so she was always there and so that became our way to still give them an end experience so they still got some kind of culminating moment and they got a narrative and a beginning middle and end but uh, it was based on what the kid wanted to do and the kid's timing and not our timing. And so that became very interesting and a really great moment for, um, we were very excited that the way that people sort of gravitated toward roles in the rehearsal process meant that uh, she got to be queen because that was a great moment I think for a lot of kids to be able to look at her and realize that they could be her if they wanted to. And that was something that people thought was really great and parents gave us feedback about. Um, we had an actor named Gail Pazersky who had this great anecdote that she still cries about whenever she talks about it. And we all had different touching experiences from this show. It's a very personal thing. And what you see families and audience members go through, um, it's a journey that you're taking together and it's intimate the entire time. And you have to be listening the entire time. Um, and so we were overwhelmed in general by the feedback that families had, the lack of programming and options that they have in general. And so they're happy that you did anything at all. Um, and the experience that they had watching their children play or do something that they didn't think that they would do um, or even make it 90 minutes in the forest when they haven't been more than 20 minutes anywhere in their entire lives is a, a deeply moving thing. Uh, so Gail's favorite story is how um, we had puppet characters. We had found through um, a variety of betas and workshops that children had gravitated more easily to puppets than they did to people, uh, particularly this community. And so she played an alpaca that was very soft, uh, named Simon. And it was the very first character that kids saw. And there was a little girl who came through that was very timid, but was absolutely in love with Simon. And so Gail went throughout the experience with you know, this child hugging her arm, basically, for you know, a solid hour. And as the show went on and Simon went with her into the forest, she just clutched more and more to this alpaca. And eventually they got in a circle and they all sang and danced together in the forest. And she got up and danced with Simon. And there was a moment where the girl was fine and independent. And so Gail stepped back to allow her to try to engage with other kids. And the parents of the girl came over and just mouthed to Gail, thank you. And she just started to cry, and the parents were emotional. You know, the kind of experience that happened for many parents there was not something that they had had in other spaces. And it became very clear to us that this work, if it's done intentionally, even if you're incredibly afraid that you're going to have a saint's tour moment where you do something very stupid, um, if you do it and you try, parents are just deeply moved by the fact that you're doing anything at all. Um, which is the unfortunate state of affairs right now, that you trying anything is applauded. Um, but we found that the reactions that we had to this particular show compared to our other immersives, um, while they're always deeply moving, for this particular community was especially meaningful. So, Vanya, um, can you talk a little bit, I, I, number one, about how fun it was to be the queen in, in terms of your experience, but can you talk just also maybe a little bit more about the Inclusive Film Project, some of the other experience that you've had with that performing and you know where do you kind of move from here do you have other you know goals or, or things that you're looking to do as a performer so um, I mentioned before uh, what I mentioned before about inclusion films is that yep. that's uh, for those who don't know I don't know who knows or not this is a um, 
a uh, inclusive film studio run out of California mainly. Uh, Bakersfield, California is where the film school is. Um, and it's, uh, it's a studio mostly for uh, people on the spectrum, although there's also, they also do accept other pe people with other disabilities. Um, and I specifically have attended their film camp for the third year running now, which is specifically for people on the spectrum and people uh, with Down syndrome, and those are the only diagnoses they take. Um, and uh, the point of their film camp, which is a two-week-long summer program, is to give uh, these people the opportunity to uh, create a short film in the span of those two weeks and to learn about the uh, process of filmmaking and the movie-making business and hopefully to eventually uh, give these people a launching point to have a career in, in film or in the arts in some, in some manner uh, to give them connections um, if that's what they so choose to do. And so I've been cast in a couple of those, uh, those films so far and that's been a lot of fun. Um, and of course is where Bricolage found me. Um, but other than that, and welcome to here, I haven't really had any experience in the arts professionally. Um, I've always been artistic in general um, in various areas, but I haven't, for example, I've never been published, my writing's never been published. Uh, this is the only professional uh, acting uh, performance I've been in, um, that sort of thing. So I don't know what my plans are from here. I'm mm -hmm. hoping to actually intern for inclusion films in the future, so I'm hoping to um, maybe do their entire summer camp circuit and work with them as a staff member. Um, and I'm hoping to go on to do more advocacy in the future um, in various areas, not just in the disability community. Um, but other than that, I don't really have much plans just because it's extremely difficult, especially for a young person, for, for a young disabled person to uh, try to get into the arts um, professionally, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with, and this is a bit of a tangent, but for example, like I am on disability payment. Uh, disability benefits, and so it's really difficult for me to try to be in the arts professionally at all because that would affect that significantly, and I right. can't afford to have that affected. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, these are these are things that our community specifically sometimes has to deal with that other artists are still trying to figure out. So there, yeah. there's a lot of other things going on. Um, I would also like to talk, Jackie, about because we, we we were sort of talking about this the sort of broad learning experience that you've had and sort of where at times we start an initiative thinking that we have to be specific um, and, uh, and make it a disability engagement and yet we learn, wow, just by kind of creating this opportunity, it actually opens up a much broader universal experience. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the radio play uh, project that you guys do and sort of how you might have, you kind of started a very specific initiative uh, that was disability specific and, and then ultimately learned there's much broader appeal to it, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of our work uh, started with the things that I learned right here at LEAD, um, which is thanks to GPAC sending me with a scholarship um, three years ago. And I went and I took all of the basic tracks because I, I felt like I knew nothing and I was terrified to even be here because I didn't know what to do or how anything worked and I felt like everybody else already did. Uh, but we've got the Pittsburgh Mafia who made me feel better uh, and told me that uh, it was okay to not know and to just learn. And so that's where it really started is with that support. Um, one of the things that I learned about was sen uh, sensory workshops. And we have a, a 1940s style radio play format called Midnight Radio. And it's set up so that um, we actually tell our audience members, you know, close your eyes, kick back, and, and listen and enjoy. And we do all of the sound effects live with Foley props. Um, and so you can sit there and you become the live studio audience, which is how you become uh, participatory, but we don't have to cast you in a role. So if you don't want to be, you know, in an immersive theater piece, but you still want to be engaged, you can come still sit in a seat uh, like you're used to, but still be part of the show. 
And so we started doing these uh, sensory workshops where we, we would you know, give you the Foley prop and allow you to recreate a scene. And it occurred to us after a year of doing them that we didn't have to call them sensory workshops, we could just call them Foley workshops and anybody could come that, you know, to market specifically to a, a certain community whenever lots of people could benefit from that uh, was actually not only cutting our audience, but also ensuring that only those people came and that there was no audience integration. And so we just started calling it a Foley workshop and it had sensory and tactile components to it and we started getting students. Uh, we, got, we got lots more people who came and were interested in just what Foley was and how to use it and wanted to recreate a scene. And so then whenever they saw the show right after that, they could actually hear the moment that they had already created and they could remember, oh, they're right, okay, there's the basketball, there's the squeaky shoes, okay, we're in the gym, I know what all these sounds are and I know what they came from. And we experienced the same thing with Welcome to Here. We did have a safe space that people could go to that was built into the show. And we didn't have a lot of kids who had autism who used it, but we did find that we needed it for lots of other things, like parents who had babies and needed to change a diaper and couldn't make it to the bathroom, or um, somebody who just needed a moment to take a very personal phone call. And of course, we gave priority to people if, if they came in and they had autism and they needed a moment. Um, but we found that by creating these things and not necessarily saying this is only for this group of people, this is something that lots of people need for a variety of reasons is a way that we found that is an interesting incorporation of the concept of universal design and you know, elevators help everybody. And so we're trying to figure out what that looks like across all of our different programs and trying to ask people what they want and how they want to be marketed to and, and what makes sense to them and trying to keep in mind that we're not so much interested in a night that's a special night for a certain group of people to come to the theater, but we're interested in finding ways to um, make choices that mean that everybody or most people can be invited and welcome and talk to all the other people who are there uh, and not kind of be segregated into this different audience section that only gets to do certain things or be with certain people or have certain moments. And sort of speaking to that idea of universal design and in integration of um, and inclusion, inclusion in general, um, specifically with bricolage, can you talk just a little more about how this has affected the way you approach your work now in, in terms of future and what your belief is in terms of how, um, how you can use those concepts of universal design, especially be in, the, in the style of work that you do because you are moving and you're traveling and you're, you're in sometimes site-specific places, um, how you can begin to use that terminology and, and then the lesson of broader engagement uh, just into your future work. So yeah, take absolutely. a second. Um, so one thing that we learned from Welcome to Here that will forever change the way that we approach immersive work is um, one of the moments that I think that we sat down with Vanya and she was like, why are you doing it this way? I just don't understand why you're doing it this way. <laughs> And uh, that is that previously our immersive pieces um, were a very mathematical experience on the back end. We know exactly where you are, when you'll be there, about how long that experience will take with a certain number of minutes of variation. And we have eyes in the sky at all times that are monitoring you. And everything has to be directly on time in order for that to work like the beautiful machine that it is. There were two things that were different in this scenario. One was that we were dealing with people who wanted to be on their own schedule, not just because they may have autism, but because they're children. <laughs> and you can't tell children where to go or what to do or how long they should play with something. Uh, and so we had to completely change everything. And we, we, we were on this grid system with the show where you, know, you were gonna be in this room for five minutes and then you're gonna go to the next thing and the, the Whispering Willow was gonna take you about three to five minutes, we were pretty sure. Uh, and it took us all of one beta test to realize that that was a mess. Um, and so <laughs> we also had a moment with, with Vanya where we had the script completed and uh, read through it and did the table read. And it's one of my favorite things that just endeared me to her <laughs> when she was a little bit more comfortable in the process. And she was like, I thought that this was for people with autism spectrum disorders. Um, there are a lot of words in this script. <laughs> And we were like, well, yeah, that's how you write a script. 
And we had this back and forth, and you know, the end result was that if you, you know, it took a lot of killing our dar darlings and throwing out our ego and listening to what she was saying, because she wasn't just speaking for herself, she was speaking for the people that she knows, she was speaking for her brothers who would come through, and though, you know, she could experience our show just fine, she knew that her brother would come in and not see anybody who was like him and hear all of these words and perhaps shut down, and we didn't want that. So we ended up with a character that was nonverbal. Um, that was met with rave reviews from parents, and that was directly due to her feedback. We ended up throwing out the grid approach altogether, and I'm genuinely curious to see uh, what next year's immersive will be. Will it be a, a grid experience? Will it be something that can be timed, but also has an untimed component that you can do at your own leisure? Um, it's a completely different way of building it, and it makes complete sense and seems like a duh moment in retrospect, but when you're in it, you know, it seemed like a duh moment for her, but when you're in it and you've always approached it that way, and that's the story of this, right? We're set in our, the, our ways of approach, and our ego gets in the way, and we're not listening enough. And so we took that note in a, in a very big way. Um, and we, I, we've extended it to a lot of our other programs, and we're trying to think now, when we do everything, we ask the question, who am I excluding? So who can't participate in that? What is the barrier? Is it within me and my resources right now to remove that barrier? Or is it just up to me to own the fact that it is a barrier and make sure that people know and then direct them to a program that they can come to? Right, and in terms of that in, in, in exclusive, or being thinking who am I excluding, and that comes into performers as well, too. So I think the lessons learned by integrating a performer with a disability can be hopefully used in the future to, in, in ways that you may not even imagine now. Um, so just another quick question for both of you, um, and I think we've sort of asked this with most of the interviews, is uh, what advice would you give to performing arts organizations, um, specifically in, 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 in uh, in, in ways of including artists with disabilities and making that accommodation and, and the rewards of that. And then also, if you want to speak in terms of uh, institutionally, some of the challenges and things that, that you may have overcome or, or you may have thought would be there would be challenges, but yet, um, you know, maybe there, maybe, maybe there weren't. Uh, and, and Vanya, too, just as a performer and based on this experience, if you have... Um, any ideas or advice that you would like to, to share for organizations? Do you want to go first? Okay. Um, I suppose that I, the most important advice would really just be to reiterate what's been already been said throughout today, which is ask and listen. Mm -hmm. um, because really, if you're going to be creating a piece for a specific community, or if you're going to be having people from a specific community on in your production, then you need to uh, then you need to ask that community what do you need, what do you want, um, because like Jackie was saying, often it's really not obvious at all to you as an outsider. Um, to me, it was so obvious that uh, if you're creating a piece for people on the spectrum you should, in, and it's supposed to be inclusive, you should uh, include ways for not completely nonverbal people to interact and to limit your reliance on language. It, that was so obvious to me that I didn't even think to mention it to either of them before the script was actually written. But as we learned, that is not obvious at all to someone who's used to writing scripts. And that's what they do. So really just communication between you and the community that you're working with and working for is the key uh, to making something that someone will feel included in and will really be able to participate in. Um, and the same, for, the same goes for when you're including people with disabilities on, on your production, um, like on your team. Uh, because the people at Bricolage really tried to work with me. And uh, the first night I came in, we sat down and I had a long talk with the entire team about my needs and what, how I would, that, things that maybe wouldn't be obvious as differences 
in processing, in mental processing or differences in how I receive information. Um, but very important to me as someone who, uh, were, who was going to be working for them. Um, because we had that long conversation, I felt a lot more comfortable being able to express my own needs throughout the, produ throughout the production. And so, again, like communication with your performers, with the people who, are, who you're working with, and making sure that like, they are comfortable telling you what, what they need from you in order to give you what you want. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Ask and listen. Um, don't just placate. Listen. Actually hear what they're saying and ask yourself, why am I doing things the way that I'm doing them? Where did this practice come from? Um, and why do I continue it in spite of feedback that I continue to get that it isn't working or isn't reaching certain people? Um, just for a little bit of context, because I know when I first came to LEAD, I thought, well, how can these people afford to do this, and how much time do they have? Uh, Bricolage is a company that is about the $500,000 budget range, and we have six full-time staff members. Um, and so we can't do everything ourselves, and it's okay to not know where to start, and it's okay to not know how to do it or to get it wrong the first couple of times. There is a very supportive community that is out there. There are people who are eager to help and to give you feedback and to make your, the place that is close to them, the arts place that is close to them, a place that is for them. And they will tell you what they want and what they need and they will be very patient and lovely and they will generously donate their time to you to tell you what you're messing up. Hmm. And all you have to do is listen and actually implement it instead of just sitting on the information. Um, and if you're lucky enough to be in a position of power, um, and you have control in your organization, do everything you can to remove every little piece of red tape that you possibly can. The reason that Brick Lodge went from a place where we had absolutely zero uh, outreach and zero initiatives in this area to three years later, having all of our programs have a component from audio description all the way to ASL to sensory workshops to you know programs that are based on this and actually creative collaborate, creatively collaborating with people with disabilities, uh, two immersive guides who can are one on one companions who will meet whatever your personal bucket of needs is whenever you come through, whatever it is. We have somebody who will greet you at the door and make sure that you have a successful experience. The way that we got there in three years is by getting rid of all of the red tape that was humanly possible and just being honest with ourselves about what we were doing right and what we weren't doing right. Great. Awesome. Thank you uh, so much. For sharing, and I, I, I want to open it up for questions. I know it's, we're getting close to the end of the day and brains are fried, but yeah, love to hear some. Hi, I don't really um, have a question per se, but I, I wanted to ask Vanya, if it's, if it's not too rude of a question to ask, would you mind sharing your age with us? I'm 18. You're 18. Well, I, I just want to say there's uh, a few times when you when you were speaking and you I think you said I you know I only have one professional acting credit and I only have one professional writing credit to to really own that and that that's a huge success uh, for any 18 year old to have. Um, so that's that's certainly the start of a bright future and I and I hope you know that. Thank you. Other questions? Tiffany, we have one down house left. Thank you. Well, first of all, this is Vanessa from the Trust again. And I am just so impressed by this entire project. And I knew about it from the onset and even read the social story that you guys created around it, but just to hear the backgrounds of what happened, it just it's, makes me wildly proud to be a part of this community here with the two of you. So thanks, thanks for that. And my question is, on average, how long did people stay in the forest? 
And then to follow that up, did you have any children or, or their family members with multiple disabilities? So another disability on top of being on the autism spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, the first, there, uh, there were two questions. One was multiple disabilities. and Oh, how, how long did kids stay in the forest? Uh, so we had hoped that it would be a 30-minute experience. Um, I think our shortest adventurer took 20 minutes, and our longest adventurers, we had to actually come up with a protocol to get kids out of the forest without them realizing that we were making them leave the forest, uh, which was usually Queen Oya coming up and just having a conversation that just happened to lead to the end of the play. Um, and so uh, we were very pleased that we had multiple parents who came to us and said, uh, my kid hasn't been 90 minutes anywhere ever. And this is our first time that we've been able to just sit and relax in the forest and just, you know, they could just watch them play like they were at a playground. And those were some of the most meaningful ones for us. Um, we did have a, a kid come through who was six years old and uh, he was blind and he had some sensory sensitivities. And so we had a phone call with the mother in advance to see what we could do. And we had piloted our concept of an immersive companion um, because immersive theater, since it is so specific and personal, it isn't as easy as just having one audio describer. You know, it starts at a different time for everybody. And because it's such a usually highly sensory-based experience, there are a multitude of barriers that could occur for you. Um, and so we had tested it out during Saints Tour to see whether or not a sort of a personal audio describer who could go through the event with you would be successful. And it, it was. Uh, so we sort of piloted it. We did a rough draft on one of our friends of the theater who's with us today, Brian Rutherford over there, uh, who kindly went through the forest like a child. Uh, and we had our audio describer, Marianne Graziano, who is a rock star, uh, go through and practice on him so that whenever Tommy came, uh, he was able to go through the forest and she was ready and already knew what to describe and knew what some, some possible barriers were. And so that was the first time that we had successfully employed our idea of an immersive companion. Um, and I don't know how many people we would be able to accommodate in that way. That's something that I'm interested in testing and seeing. Um, but we were very excited that we had done the work the year before to be able to make it successful this year. Brian, do you want to say anything about that? <laughs> No, it, it's great. It's great that, that they opened it up to a, a bigger window than just the one uh, the one sensibility and, and, and whatnot. And it was awesome. And it was great to actually circle back. I went back. I was planning on going on my own uh, without a describer. Uh, and the fact that they decided to open it up. And uh, then I later got back with them and go, how did it go? What would, how, did he do, how did he like it? How did he like my feedback? and what I thought would work for him, and that was great. And we did have um, a, a few kids who came who also were in a wheelchair, um, but as our space is ADA accessible, um, you know, it, we had dealt with that and crossed that barrier before, so it, it didn't uh, really present much of a barrier for us. Any other questions? So I think now, I think we're just sort of going to transition into kind of a wrap up. So thank you guys for hanging out. Thank yeah. You. Not sure we're, I'm not sure we're, oh. She didn't have to leave. So Christine and I are going to uh, begin this uh, wrap-up portion. Christine, are you more comfortable with the chair? So, Tiffany, I guess if you could kind of help us a little bit with kind of going through some of the post-it notes and just sort of reading out some of the responses that, that have come through the day and then allow us to sort of wrap up what these, um, these ideas are. Great, happy to do that. You all had some really great thoughts, so thank you for that. 
Um, the little cluster that uh, was about insights. Um, let's see, sorry if I'm not in the camera shot here well. Um, one was uh, design and accessibility don't have to be in conflict. I also think that design can be the solution to accessibility issues. So that's an insight. Uh, finding the real on the spectrum between pity and inspiration. Another great insight. Uh, when disability is uh, something, the common denominator, i.e. studio artist residencies, then disability fades into the background and the art practice moves to the foreground. Great one. Let's see, one to one to one to one. <laughs> Each artist you help can grow exponentially. Absolutely. Um, listening happens with many senses. Great. And working on being inclusive will cause lots of missteps, but must keep the pendulum moving forward. Great. So those were our groups of sort of insights. Um, let's see. A couple other things that I think were were probably insights also. Um, need, need for open discussion about disability aesthetics. Great one. Um, disability disabled arts is profitable and should be marketed as, as such. Accessibility should be part of a basic customer service. And institutional artist driven development of a new canon changing the stories on stage. Great. Actions that were coming out of the day. Is this helpful? Do you want me to pause? Or? <laughs> OK, all right. Actions that were coming out of the day. Um, advocacy with Alliance for Artist Communities to further move residencies for artists, to further mo move or create residencies for artists with disabilities. Absolutely. That's one for all of us. Um, always ask the artist what he or she or they prefers for accommodations. Um, collaborations are critical, and inclusive collaborations are imperative, good action steps. And then finally, um, this was sort of the list of questions that were still out there. Um, a couple that are, let's see, a couple general ones and then a couple that are kind of specific to Vermont Studio Center. Um, one is, let's see, the non-specific ones are, as providers of arts programming, are we learning about the populations that we are serving? If so, how deeply? And I think we've had a lot of examples of that today that we're, we're starting to get deeper, but we can always go more deeply. Um, as arts providers, how are we seeking out these individuals with disabilities who are not fortunate enough to have the arts in their lives as audience members or otherwise? How are we cultivating outsider, outlier artists? Another question is how do public spaces typically get accessibility wrong? I think we've all seen many examples of that. Um, another question uh, regarding artist residencies. Is it better to have an inclusive, limited residency or a separate residency for artists with disabilities, an inclusive, integrated residency or a, di a separate artist one for artists with disabilities? And I think that's a good question that we've touched on here. Um, for Vermont Studio Center, uh, this. Fund that their Creative Access Fellowship enriched the mission of the organization. Who else has seen that happening to their organizations? Who else has seen accessibility related things um, really enhance, enhance the mission of their organization? Um, and for Vermont Studio Center, how do you address barriers that exist for people with disabilities in the application process? Which I think also applies to grants and other things like that. Good question. Yeah. So lots of good questions, and um, Christine, what are, what are your thoughts in terms of like themes for the day? To me, it was, um, I think, I, I mean, I, and for me, I think the whole purpose of, of today was really kind of how we, at this conference, can begin to go beyond just front of the house and into how do we get our stages, how do we get our galleries, how do we get um, those, those other, that creation of art. Uh, accessible, more accessible and more inclusive. And um, to me what really stuck out was the idea of really getting to know the artist. How do we go about finding those artists? How do we make, um, uh, and, and I think it, it, it does take a little bit of action from, um, 
a performing arts center uh, and, and from the, the harbingers of, of that art to really make that effort uh, and that it's not just something that happens once, but how does it happen again and again and again. Um, and uh, that also there are artists with disabilities that are out there uh, and they are creating work in a variety of different ways. Um, so it, it's just making that effort to, to find and build those relationships. I do think uh, there's a lot of resources in this room that we can build upon, that we can rely on each other if we have questions, when we have questions. I'm going to say when we have questions because I'm going to assume that those of us in this room are going to take some of these things that we've discussed today back to our respective organizations and figure out how we can implement them because w one of the things that that's I think really important is that we don't leave this conversation in the room. That we really take steps, even if they're baby steps, one, you know, one or two actionable items that um, are going to make a difference in your organizations and start to create that sea change. Just even if it's a shift in thinking, if you go back to your organization and say, hey, are we, you know, uh, have we reached out to any artists with disabilities or have we thought about having someone with a disability on our creative staff, um, you know, just to start to open up ideas about that perspective of disability? Um, I, to me, that's the most important thing because so often, well, David and I do so many of these types of things and so often people say, yes, we have these great conversations and we're all so jazzed even though we're exhausted because we've all been here for a week and our heads are, are full of these amazing ideas. And then we go back and our desk is, looks like this and we've got 5,000 emails in our inbox and then we just forget everything because we're so overwhelmed with the 57 jobs that we, you know, we, the 57 different hats we wear with our one job. So I think if there's a, a way that we can sort of clear all that out of our minds and go, okay, I'm, we're going to make this a priority, even if it's something small, that's a step forward. Okay, so I'm sitting down because I was going to stay away, but then I realized that I, all right, so one thing that my ADD brain does well is it pulls out themes, universal themes to things. And what I was hearing today was um, talking with each other. But one of the things that I also heard was, and, and, and it struck me especially with something that Vanya said, was developing trust. That communication develops trust because as Barack was saying, there's a level of vulnerability, especially for artists. Artists, I think when are asked because I'm not one, I see you all differently, right? I see the courage you have in sharing what is inside you in your art, right? But every time we are talking about artists with disabilities, and I have this conversation with artists with disabilities all the time, is they are listening very carefully when you are invited to work with them to see whether you are genuinely interested in them or whether you are hoping to tap into another stream of funding by having them as a prop, right? And so what this comes down to is authenticity and credibility. You. I'm, I don't want anyone to walk out of this room saying, yeah, well, I'll have a couple of extras or, you know, I like that concept of the guy without the hand being a zombie or a pirate. We can do that, right? I don't want you to walk out of the room with that. I want you to walk out of the room with, I want this voice, this perspective to be not res just respected, but celebrated and valued, right? Um, you know, they're getting ready for the art experiences that we had this week and getting ready for this day. I came in with ideas of how it was going to happen, but everything became so much more nuanced along the way. Our four performers for Thursday night all had incredibly different ways of working 
incredibly different concerns from coconut water to wearing a ducky hat to, you know, um, getting a room with two beds and a roll-in shower, which until that moment I did not know was available in the hotel where we had booked everyone, right? It, it, you know, it required so much hospitality, like Ryan was saying, a hospitality industry, and a desire to make it a smooth and pleasant experience. And I think what, and there was, you know, we worked really hard to let people know we wanted them to come for themselves, not to be the representative of um, black artists with disabilities or to be the single representative of people who use wheelchairs. You know, I mean, we wanted people to come and be themselves. So there is a level of tokenism that is possible in this. And so though it come away with, hey, I like you as a person and I want to listen to what you have to say and make you welcome here for who you are, which is really how we should probably approach everyone in the world, right? But that is what I've learned from all of this is that you, this is hard work, but it's been the best work, you know? Well, one of the things, I mean, I think if you, if you look at it from the perspective putting, of putting the art first, yeah. that it's, it's going to put you way ahead of the game. If you, because when you deal with a, a not, let's say, a non-disabled actor, right? You have a company manager who sets all that up, and there are going to be actors who have specific concerns. They don't have, they may not have anything to do with access requirements, mm -hmm. or they may, but they may just be requirements of, of that particular artist, but you, uh, you know, you have to sort of look at it in the sense, what is in the best service of the art? What's in the best service of the art is making sure that that artist is functioning at optimal levels so they can make the best art they know how to make. And, and I think if we look at it that way, then, then we're sort of erasing all of the, uh, the, um, the categorizations. And somebody said, uh, David and I um, were um, facilitating a panel with casting directors a, a, a few months ago, and someone said, and I wanted to say this before in working with deaf actors, and I don't think DJ is still here. No, he had to leave to get to his flight. But deaf actors, you know, they, they, they do face um, issues that other disabled actors don't face because a lot of, a lot of the pushback that they receive is, is funding, is money. Oh, it costs too much to have rehearsal interpreters. It costs too much to have interpreters for auditions. And, and it's not an unreasonable request for a, a deaf actor to ask for an interpreter and a qualified interpreter. That doesn't mean an interpreter who interpret me to interprets meetings. That means a theatrical interpreter who knows how to accurately interpret auditions for deaf actors, which mm -hmm. I think DJ started to speak about briefly. Um, and one of the casting directors sitting on that panel just had a light bulb moment. She said, I don't understand why it's such a big deal. When we have a musical theater audition, we think nothing of hiring an accompanist for the entire day, and the accompanist plays for 90 seconds, and then they are doing nothing for five minutes, and they play for another 90 seconds, and they do nothing for five minutes, but we don't even bat an eyelash when we are, when we're building in that expense into our budget. Why don't, we, why don't we afford the same consideration to deaf actors? So I think if we level the playing field by thinking of it as what is going to make the artist that we're bringing in, what's going to make it conducive for them to do the best work they can do and so that we can see what we're cap they're capable of doing, that, that makes it a lot easier to sort of move forward in our thinking. I, if it's okay with you all, I wanted to see if yeah, you yeah. have thoughts in the room, especially anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask anything or say anything today. Um, and then I will just say, too, I'm kind of curious how Betty and Jessica feel about the day and, so, and their thoughts on this whole thing. So just, just let me know if you want to say anything. <laughs> Anybody else want to suggest, want to have, say something here? 
I don't know why I'm always saying something, but I, I actually, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Betty and Jessica, because one of my questions was, I'm new to going to Leeds, this is my first time here, and this is great, um, but I don't know enough about what the follow-up opportunities are through Leeds, and maybe they or somebody else could speak to that a little bit. One thing in particular that I would love to have out of today is, and maybe out of the entire week, if there's any note-taking that has happened sort of universally that has given like the websites that people have mentioned or some of the spelling of some of the things that I've been unfamiliar with. You know, a quick Google couldn't find them because I probably heard it wrong. Um, and then is there a Facebook page for leads that people can post to that can share through or some other way of doing that? So that would be great information for me to have. The captioning that happens today is already on HowlRound, so there's actually already a transcript there, and then it will be cleaned up also, but do you all want to talk about the listserv and things? Or? And, and just so you know, on HowlRound, this is being, it's going to be available as a, yeah. Okay, so this is Betty Siegel from the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and thank you so much for all participating and being such amazing speakers and sharers of fabulous um, experiences and information. Um, we do, if you uh, attend LEAD, one of the benefits and perks of attending LEAD is that you get to participate on a listserv that we've run for many years. It's a listserv where we throw out questions to one another, our peers, uh, for guidance, advice, and information. So you have to come to LEAD to be eligible to get on the listserv, though. So this is just my big plug to come to Austin, Texas in a year, 2017. Um, generally, though, just since you asked for an opinion, and I think I can speak for Jessica and I both, we really feel very strongly um, about the impact that these kinds of conversations can have on us as a community. We also really strongly believe, and I think this is true when we look at the values of Kennedy himself, of courage and service, um, and there are many more that I could list, that art, good art, is what we are looking for. Good art changes and shapes society, and we need to be open to good art regardless of where it comes from, who it comes from, or why it's coming out. So thank you guys for helping us identify that. One of the things that, that just came out for me in the day too is just thinking about the ways I sort of too started in lead and, and like learning about all the kind of audience access ways and accommodations and things. Um, and then to take it to this level, the, the way the relationships are built and the depth of the experience and the way we move through the world with the artists that we're working with if we're, if we're doing things to present them or to host them or to have them in our companies is so much deeper and more transformative. Mm -hmm. And I think for an institution, for the individuals working together, for all of the humans connecting around it, I, I, that's another powerful point in all of this, I think. You know, I, it, I'm, can I just throw, I want to say something about you in particular, Barack, because I, one of, we hired a, um, we hired one of my colleagues who is a multidisciplinary artist who's focusing on, focusing on her music right now to sort of stage manage our performance on Thursday night. And last night at two o'clock in the morning, I was texting her because we, we texted two o'clock in the morning. And I looked at it just now and she said to me, she said, make sure that she said to me, thank you for hiring me to stage manage because I learned more than I gave back and I already know 48 hours later that this has upped my art more than I thought it could. It was that Harry Potter Voldemort wand moment. Um, and that was a very brief day, right? Um, and so I'm just saying that when we were talking about the one question that I heard here is how has this impacted these organizations? Every single organization, and they're not all here that we talked to about participating in this day, every single arts manager we spoke to said, 
working with an artist with a disability, didn't matter what it was, changed them, their organization, their work, and it was like an exponential leap because of that depth that Tiffany was just speaking of. Yeah. I also think it changes the, um, the, it changes the interaction with the audience access when you're working with disabled artists. I think it changes the conversation, it opens up the conversation in, in ways that people aren't even aware of because then they're thinking, they're looking at the entire picture. Barack, did you have a question? <clears throat> so this is Barack. Um, I really appreciate, and I didn't get a chance to, and I forget your name, Sarah. Um, because this kind of talks to the notion of what happens next. I, lo I was talking to Sarah and I think Brandon, but Brandon was talking about the ways in which they're, they are creating learning communities. And I thought, that is so incredible. You know, like at each community in terms of what LEAD offers, that they stimulate within their own this kind of learning community. And I'm fascinated by that idea. I'm fascinated with how I can go back to Chicago and then stimulate that, even with those who have not necessarily been a part of this conference, because I think that that is the continuation of the conversation. Um, so I want to affirm that. I just want to, that felt like a shining light on this notion of the learning community and building that as continued conversation. And then one of the things that I always deeply desire because I'm so much into networks is that in this room, there are those who've talked, those who share their names, but I feel like I haven't had the opportunity for anyone to go around the room. And I, will, I don't know if we have time, but I would love that because I'm not necessarily connected to a listserv or da 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 or a leak. I'm just wondering if there's any opportunity for people just to, if they want to, to share who they are and where they're from. Well, you know, that's a, I, this is, can I ask a very quick question? Because one of our goals today was to, there are people doing this work, and you guys have been doing it for decades. Um, we want to build the national network, right? And we wanted to have this conversation be the beginning, but I have um, had no brain space to figure out what's happening next or how we will build the network or what shape it will be. And nor do I particularly want to do that, um, personally, myself because I don't know if I, I'm not qualified to do it. Um, so my question is for you, and you don't have to answer it now because we're all tired, but we can post something, we can use Google Docs, we can find a format to share information with you. And if you would like us to share your contact information, you can let us know. And what I am hoping, we'll find a way to get out to you people and get the word out, because don't we have most email addresses, Tiffany? I think so. If you did not sort of register either with the Kennedy Center or with my organization, let me know. But I think we have most folks. But I do, I do love the suggestion to quick go around the room. I think that would be a good, good use of our time. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. totally cool with that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we All right. Yeah. I'm gonna go first. Well, I already spoke. But Esther Grimm, the executive director of Three Arts. I'm Gina Rathel. I am also with Three Arts. I'm the manager of operations and development. Make sure you hold up the mic right to your mouth. I know it's counterintuitive, but you need to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Jocelyn Rozak. I come for the performance side of um, theater, singing, acting, and dancing. But I'm looking to get more into perhaps the management side of arts, working with people with disabilities, community engagement. So this was a perfect way to come and start to learn about those issues today. So it was really helpful for me today. Thank you. Where are you from? Uh, oh, yes, I'm based here in Pittsburgh. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Benji Blanco, I'm the new creative arts manager at Achieva, which is a local nonprofit that provides services and advocacy for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I just moved back to Pittsburgh. I've been gone for about five years. So Pittsburgh people, come talk to me. Achieva has open positions. It's a wonderful organization. I'm Jesse Ryan. I'm the manager of education and community programs at the Pittsburgh Symphony. I'm Vanya Ramsey. Um, I am a disabled performer um, a, here in Pittsburgh. Jackie Baker, Brick Lodge Production Company in Pittsburgh. David Bielowitz, performing artist, Pittsburgh. 
Betty Siegel, Director of VSA and Accessibility at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. Jessica Swanson, Manager of Accessibility at the Kennedy Center in D.C. My name is Elizabeth Rossetti and I'm with the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. I am Caitlin Scaff. I am the Assistant Operations Director for Prime Stage Theater here in Pittsburgh. Porig Nocton, Director of Arts and Disability Ireland. Nicole Remmer, I'm the Executive Director of Sweetwater Center for the Arts, about 10 miles up the river from here. Hi, my name is Sarah Corrin. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. I work for the city of Raleigh, and I'm the Arts Grant Coordinator. Hello, I'm Karina Coyman. I am based here in Pittsburgh, and I am the Art Studio Coordinator at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. I'm Rebecca Torres, artist and founder and director of Backbones. And I'm Ryan Walsh, a former development director and writing program director at Vermont Studio Center. I just moved to Pittsburgh this week. Oh. <laughs> I'm just a personal assistant. So. Just what? What's your name? Elizabeth Sanchez. Uh, my name is Christina Salgado. I work for Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. I'm their director of education and community engagement. Vanessa, you're next. I'm Vanessa Braun. I direct all of the accessibility programs here at the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. Viv Schaefer. I'm the accessibility and inclusion coordinator at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. Brian Rutherford, and I'm an uh, accessibility peer here in Pittsburgh. Hi, everyone. My name is Kayla, and I work for Dog and Pony DC. And I'm the and I'm an apprentice with Dog and Pony in DC. Hi, I'm Daniel Ellison. I'm from Durham, North Carolina, and I teach at Duke University a course on legal issues for the performing arts. Um, and I'm chair of the Durham Cultural Advisory Board. Hi, I'm Kristen Link, and I am the director of education and accessibility for City Theatre Company here in Pittsburgh. Hi, I'm Claire Drobot. I'm the director of new play development, I'm also from City Theatre in Pittsburgh. I'm Reagan Linton, actor, writer, performer, currently based in Bozeman, Montana, but kind of all over the place. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Cuenca. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at Off the Wall Productions, which is in Carnegie, about seven miles from Pittsburgh. Hi, I'm Sarah McCown. I am the Managing Director at Off the Wall with Erica down in Carnegie. There have been quite a few people who have also left that are not from Pittsburgh, believe it or not. Um, but, they, uh, but there have been quite a few that have left um, because to catch flights and things like that. Um, we actually started the day with like 25, started Monday with like 25 people registered and as of yesterday it was 60. So I think that is showing that there's um, a critical mass of interest. Yeah, I was, I mean, my thought was this, that idea of the pendulum and I really feel like there's this there's a there's a uh, a pendulum sort of shift in in terms of authenticity uh, when it comes to disability specifically in casting and I think also um, uh, in in terms of other inclusive ways that we're we're engaging artists and so I hope uh, the conversation as we said continues to move forward and that as uh, I guess DJ and Beth were saying that the pendulum has shifted enough and even if it begins to kind of push back in a different direction that we've gone far enough that, um, that we're, we're not gonna go back too far, that we're gonna continue to move in a forward direction. I'm gonna well inter better. interrupt and introduce myself because I, I missed the round, sorry. I'm Sarah Aziz, I'm the director of the Three Rivers Arts Festival and Festival Management here in Pittsburgh slash Coffee Girl. <laughs> Coffee savior, we will call you. 
So I, um, five minutes, sir. you know, I, yeah, we have five minutes for questions um, or summing thoughts, actually, because I'm not so sure if we have any questions. I mean, if, we, if anybody has a question, your brains are not mush. I am so impressed. Um, but what do you guys think? I just, I just want to reiterate. I just want to thank you all for staying all yeah, day. Absolutely. A long day. Um, Thank you all for staying, but just to reiterate, please use, let's use each other as resources. Honestly, I mean, David and I are here. We didn't uh, give you our email or our website, but um, it's on. We'll get everything we, to everyone. Everything, yeah, I mean, I would just encourage all of us to use each other because you heard, so, I mean, the whole point of today was to hear some of the best practices models of w what's going on. And I, I think I speak for everybody who came up and spoke today about their experiences that they would probably welcome people who have questions saying, okay, we're, we were interested in what you're doing at Bricolage. Can you, can you sort of walk us through the pro process? You know, and that's, it's the one to one to one to one. Is, is what's going to make the change. Even if you're a big organization, I want to stress that too. If you're a large organization and your job title doesn't fit into necessarily what we've been talking about today, there are things you can do to sort of help that conversation along at your institution. I think Reagan had... She did. Oh, yeah. I just, I just um, from a perspective as an artist, I just want to say thank you Pittsburgh, thank you, Pittsburgh Cultural Art Trust. Thank you, LEAD. Up to this point, I feel like, you know, there was the convening at the LARC, um, but really there is no national or international convening of this sort, particularly for artists with disabilities to have these conversations and collaborate. And I, um, it's amazing. Bravo, Pittsburgh, all of you, and uh, keep, yeah, moving that pendulum forward. And may I simply say that these two people made this day, right? Without them um, and their knowledge and their expertise, and this is what they do, so don't forget about them. Call them, talk to them. You know, the Alliance for Inclusion in the Arts is exactly that. And you need to take advantage of this expertise and talent. And frankly, you guys, like, you scare me you're so good. So well, um, you guys, you know, I mean, don't, t don't give us all the credit. No, I, I think absolutely. I think it was, it was, it was coming from you guys and, and really wanting to, um, to collaborate and, 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 and really bring this conversation forward. So again, thanks no, so much to Pittsburgh Cultural Trust and, and also, obviously, the the leadership at lead to allow this day to happen. Great. Yeah, and I wanted to bring Vanessa back up because she was so much, it was really Anne and Vanessa sitting in rooms, having meetings over many months, having phone and calls. I'm happy to be part of their team, but it really, two of them, I'm so, so proud. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm gonna really quickly, one more time, acknowledge Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. Yes. Kennedy Center, all of the partners who made this possible, FISA Foundation, Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, NEA, really important conversation. And really, most importantly, all of you, as you know, everyone who participates in these conversations, that's, that's what these are all about. So thank you for coming. I think that's it. Are we good? Yay. And we're done. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>